Good morning, everyone. Pleasant Sabbath to each and every one of you here. And I believe that you are here for a purpose, and that is to hear a message from God's Word that will bring us closer to Him, enable us to search our hearts, and to be at the end of this service more closely drawn to Jesus Christ. Now, we want to be able to hear God's voice. That is something that is critically important. But God cannot speak to us unless our hearts are open and our minds are impressible. But we have to look into ourselves first, examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. We want to understand what it means to draw closer to God through repentance and confession and we will kneel in prayer, ask God's blessing upon us, and then enter into this devotion. Let us pray. Our dear God and Father, we thank you for this privilege of worship. We thankful for the privilege of coming before your presence, recognizing your sovereignty and your love toward each one of us. Bless your word to our hearts this morning. As we yield our spirits to you, may you transform them and give them back to us, renewed, sanctified, so that we may truly manifest your love and compassion even toward others. So bless and guide and direct Break up the ice and slime of selfishness that is in our hearts. And may we truly see what we, are really, what we really are like in your sight as we examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. So bless, guide, direct. Let your Holy Spirit be present. Let your angels be amongst us to impress your spirit into our souls. We thank you for hearing, for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel, the ninth chapter. And we are looking at two verses first, verses 3 and 4, well, 3, 4, and 5, three verses. Daniel chapter 9, here Daniel's prayer. Truly a prayer of consecration. And I trust that we get the important message God wants us to get this morning. What did we say repentance leads to? Repentance leads to confession. Genuine confession, but there can be no genuine confession unless there's genuine, true genuine repentance. If we are really sorry about something, it will lead us to stop doing it. Am I right? If you're really sorry about something. Suppose I were to hit you with a piece of stick and said, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry I hurt you. And then do it again and say, sorry, sorry, I, I shouldn't hurt you. And then I do it again. Am I really sorry? I'm not really sorry. Yeah. If I'm really sorry, if I'm really sorry, what should I do? Cease from doing it. If I'm really sorry. So in the same way, when we do wrong, we hurt God. And when we come before God and we tell him that we are sorry, the evidence that we are really sorry is not only turning away from it, confessing it, but forsaking it, it leads to change. We have not yet experienced that paradigm shift of actually, truly repenting and turning away from that which we say that we are sorry for doing. Not yet. It's interesting that God has messages on repentance and confession to bring to us. But tell me, can we ever get those messages if we are not present. Suppose God had a message to give to us. There are a lot of people who won't get it. Yeah? A lot of people who won't get that message. 
They never avail themselves of the opportunity to get it. So we are talking here about self-examination. Daniel chapter 9 from verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God. Notice Daniel. Daniel's true heartfelt prayer. I set my face unto the Lord God to do what? To seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord. First he sought the Lord. He set his face towards the Lord. Then he sought by prayer and supplication. And then he prayed unto the Lord God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keep the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Verse 5, what does true confession lead a person to do? Acknowledge, we have sinned. Have we sinned as a church, as leaders, as individual? Acknowledging is critically important, but acknowledging is just one thing. It must lead to change. I said before, if we keep on doing things the same way that we are accustomed to doing them, we are going to get the same results we are accustomed to getting. If we want different results then we have to do things differently. But we are so content the way we have worked in the past, even though what we have done in the past is not clearly working for us. It's not working. It's not working. Whether it be our marriages, in our workplace, our attitude, what we are doing and have been doing is not working for us. We need to try something different. It's Daniel said, we have prayed, we have sinned, and have committed iniquity. What is Daniel talking about? He is talking about that inner bent to sin, that inclination, that disposition that leads people to do what they do. Deep down inside is the desire. And even though we may make excuses for what we do, deep down inside, the Spirit of God shows our dishonesty in our attitude, in our behavior, and in our action. The Spirit of God knows it, and in our conscious mind, we know it too. We have sinned in what area we individually know. We have sinned and committed iniquity. Notice the word is iniquity, that inner bank of sin. It is not talking about transgression, even though in some cases that is since transgression is the problem, a deliberate violation of a loan law. And iniquity leads to transgression or sin coming short of the glory of God. But it is those excuses inside of us, deep down in us, that lead us to do or commit transgression. That is the iniquity, that inner bank, that inclination, that tendency, that desire. And sometimes even though we are praying, we say we would like to stop but deep down inside, God knows we really have not resolved the issue from the level of iniquity. That is why it will become transgression. And then we come short of the glory of God. I've told you the story already about Jack. Jack had a problem smoking and drinking, and he wanted to stop. And he prayed to God, he said, and the pastor came to the pastor, and the pastor said, Jack, have you prayed about it? Jack said, yes, pastor, I've prayed about it. And the pastor asked Jack, what did you pray? He said, I pray and ask the Lord to help me to stop smoking and drinking. And the pastor said, Jack, you're praying a wrong prayer. The, the Lord has never come down from heaven and remove a bottle from anybody's mouth, nor a cigarette. So the next time you pray, Jack, pray a prayer like this. Lord, remove from me the desire to want to smoke and drink. And the moment Jack said that, the, pa the pastor said that, Jack looked at the pastor with an upturned face and said, but pastor, if I pray that prayer, I won't get my cigarette nor my rum. Did Jack really, really want to stop smoking and drinking? Sometimes we do that with the Lord. And we say, not this time, Lord, the next time. Not this time, the next time. But God knows our hearts. 
We really don't want to give it up yet. We have not reached the point where we abhor it. Example, punctuality. We have not yet reached the point where we abhor coming to church late for a divine appointment with the judge of the universe. We have not yet reached the point where we truly confess, where we have repented of it and confess. I give one example. And some people got that problem. Others may not have it. That is what we are talking about. It may be an area in which we may be eating something that we like. And as we have learned, it is not eating the things we like to eat. It is liking the things we have to eat that will give us good health. So changing our perspective is critically important. Changing our perspective. So Daniel prayed a prayer like this. I set my face unto the Lord. Seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and so on. And then he said, I prayed unto the Lord. And then he acknowledged, I have sinned. We have sinned. We have sinned. Notice the language. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly. Now tell me, there's a man who is a professed Christian. When he doesn't do what God wants, is he doing more wicked than a man in the world who doesn't know what is right? Yeah. Yeah, the Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, what is it? To him it is sin. So the Christian, well a professed Christian, who is doing what is contrary to God's word, is doing more wickedly than a man who is an open avowed sinner. Because the Christian knows better. He knows he's coming before the God of the universe, the eternal judge, who knows everything, who weighs everything, and still he persists. In doing it. And how, how many sins does it take in order to, for a person to become an instrument of unrighteousness? One sin. Inspiration says one sin cherish. One sin retained in the life. The man is an instrument of unrighteousness. And then there's another statement that says one sin cherish and retain neutralizes all the power of the gospel. Neutralizes. Removes any effect it may have. I tell you. It is said that there are some little minor ailments that we may get, like a bee sting or a centipede sting, that onion and some of those substances like that can help bring relief. It neutralizes. It helps to really deal with, bring relief. Some home remedies. Neutralizes the effects of the pain. But one sin, cherish. One sin, retain. Unconfessed. Unrepented of. Unforsaken. Neutralizes all the power of the gospel. All of it. Just takes one. So Daniel prayed from the depth of his heart. And then he not only said, we have sinned. But he also said, and done wickedly. He said, and have rebelled. Even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. But Daniel could pray that prayer because Daniel had reached a point where he did some serious introspection. Look at chapter 10. Tim, Daniel 10. Daniel 10, verse 8. Daniel 10 and verse 8. Daniel said, Therefore, I was left alone after he got a vision of God, verse 7. He got a vision of God. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Notice what, how Daniel felt, how he saw himself. After he had that revelation from God, all his comeliness was turned in him to corruption. He saw himself. So we project one figure to the world and then project another to the church and then project another in the family. We are playing the hypocrite. We claim we like everybody and we love everybody, but there's one person who we have a grudge against. We don't like that body. We are playing the hypocrite too. Because if I love everybody in here, hate one, I am a hypocrite. I'm just playing 
again, as it were, with God. I who have a grudge against that body. You know how you should see that body? In the same light you see the one that you say you like the most in terms of loving them. But we are very partial as human beings. And we are very prejudiced against other people. And we are very hard on them, but soft on ourselves. When we should be harder on ourselves, we'll be softer towards people. Watch it now. So that, that Daniel's experience. Turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah had another experience as well. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5. Let the word of God speak this morning. Isaiah 6 verse 5. After Isaiah had that revelation of God's glory. Listen to what Isaiah felt about himself and how he saw himself. Isaiah said, verse 5, Isaiah 6 verse 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. Now, do you know what a man of unclean lips is like? He's filthy in his mind. Because the lips are not the problem. The problem comes from the mind. And it is said that we have the power to believe. But what we believe can affect what we think as well. So it works both ways. Yesterday I gave a, 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 a discourse at the Hilton Hotel, motivational talk, dealing with the power of the mind, the power of beliefs and choice. A large audience, and I said I can't let this opportunity pass. So I function in a lot of capacities there as a minister, made some appeals. This is a big uh, conference. Not only did they deal with the mind, but attitude, behavior, deal with the family, child training, parenting, we went into everything. Gospel. At the end of it, a man sent, uh, gave me a note to read. He said, the text you quoted was the wrong text. So even the man was following religiously. It shouldn't be Philippians 2.13. It should be Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ. A Trinidadian lady came up front and said, you know, I haven't heard the rest yet, but I know that this is, this is what I wanted. This is what I want. It made an impression. It made an impression. And I prayed hard, asking the Lord to put the exact words in my mouth that I may, like Daniel, make that impression upon her that people can. And every time I pray a prayer like that, I find that the Lord really responds well. Albeit, I mean, uh, it was, we, we enjoyed ourselves, albeit they gave me a gift. At the end, a bottle of rum. Um, of course, they apologized afterwards saying, sorry, sorry. Um, that was for some of the others, but not for you. Anyhow, we have another one for you. So Isaiah reached that point where he saw his true condition. Unless we as a congregation see our true condition and truly repent, we will never confess Acknowledge that is come up before the podium. Yes, if we know we have done it publicly, we confess publicly. If we have mismanaged publicly, we need to confess publicly. If we have misrepresented someone publicly, we need to confess and repent publicly. We have not yet, we are too ashamed to do it. We have not yet reached a point where we allow God's spirit to really empty us of self. That's our biggest enemy. And to smell the slime of selfishness that usually pollutes. You know what I said at that conference too? That we worry too much about what people say and think about us. Rather than being just what God wants us to be. We allow how people think and feel about us to cripple us to the point where we cannot perform as we should. So deep down inside, first, we are not honest with ourselves. That's number one. We are not honest and true with our consciences. And we are not honest and true with others. 
We, of course, deep down inside, we know we are not honest and true with God, and therefore we are walking about as a lie. We say we are sorry for what we have done, but we are not changing our course. We are not seeking a different way that we know will please God. And that is an evidence when we reach that point of feeling that conviction, that burden, seeing that we have sinned in word, in thought, in deed, and I must add also sometimes in letter. Because we may not speak it like one person, they, they may write it down. And it may cause a lot of pain and hurt and discomfort. All of these things are what we need to confess. We have said it the wrong way by pen or voice. That is where repentance is truly needed. And therefore, confession will follow when we choose to continue to yield to the spirit that brought about the conviction. It is in that frame of mind that Jesus started off the, the, the be attitude, the attitude that we should be, the be attitude. When Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at the attitude. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be. So it is only in a position of mourning that people can be comforted. It is only in a position of being poor in spirit, not believing you're better than anybody else, poor in spirit, that the kingdom of heaven is yours. All right, I want to close with an important, this is a big subject, but Steps to Christ. The little book, Steps to Christ, page 65. I want to listen carefully to this principle. What is the evidence that we are coming closer to God? What is the evidence? The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. The more what? Faulty. Black is seen as blacker in the background of white. Am I right? Gray is seen as darker, darker gray than if it is in a light gray background. It's important. The contrast is greater when the other one is the opposite is present. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clear. And your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. In that situation, we don't find an excuse for doing it because deep down inside, sometimes we know that we are making up excuses for what we are doing wrong. We know that. Deep down inside. But God knows that we are not honest with ourselves. As you see a man honest into God in his conscience, the Bible says he can stand before kings. So standing before 250 to 300 people yesterday, a lot, almost all, I only knew about two or three. You think these people get nervous. People get nervous. But when I ask the Lord to give me a word to say, it doesn't matter who's in front of me. And the thing is, when I told the people that, the people respected that. Stop trying to be somebody else. Stop trying to regurgitate what others are saying. Come to your own conclusions yourself. Pray about it. Do like the Bereans. Go home and check to see if these things are so. Let the word of God become a part of you, me, a part of my experience for myself so that I can be and give the gospel according to my unique identity or character experience rather than trying to be like somebody else. So this statement is so deep. For your vision will be clear and your imperfection will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. This is the evidence. Listen to that statement. This is evidence that the Satan's delusions have lost their power. That's the evidence. God doesn't want us to see ourselves as we see ourselves. He doesn't want us to see ourselves as others see us. He doesn't want us to see ourselves as we would like to be. He wants us to see ourselves as he sees us. 
And he sees us in two ways. That we are corrupt. That we are filthy. That we are undone. And at the same time, we are children of the heavenly king. Because the closer you come to Christ, the more you will see his purity. And the more God recognizes by your humility and your contrition of spirit that you have the genuine article. You're not trying to plaster it over. You're not trying to cover it up. The Bible says he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. It may take a little while, but the longer you cover it up, the more damage it does while it is present. And some of the damage is unconscious. I've had people who were referred to me. They lost a loved one, but they didn't cry. They lost a good best friend. They didn't cry. Something else happened. Didn't cry. Then they complained of chest pains, which is one of the signs of anxiety disorder too. Sweaty palms, palpitation of the chest. It is not a medical problem per se. Not a medical problem. But not willing to let go of their emotions to bring it out, that is. We stifle how we feel generally. We, don't even, we are not even honest when we're telling people things. We hint it to them. Hope they will get it. We hint it. We are not direct and forthright. We like to go around the issue, hoping the person will get the right impression. But God says, that's not going to work. Anyhow, let me close. It says, this is the evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power. That the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. That's the evidence. No deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not realize its own sinfulness. Unless a person recognizes his own sinfulness, he will not be led to repentance, furthermore confession. It says, the soul that is transformed by the grace of Christ will admire his divine character. But if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. There are some people who have a negative point of view of looking at things. No matter how good it may be, they have a negative point of view of looking at things and of people. And don't think it is only towards the people whom they don't like or have a grudge against. Oh no, it doesn't work like that. The human mind does not work like that. It usually spills over into other dealings with other people as well. Because if you're inconsistent with one and you don't like that one and you're playing the hypocrite with that one, you will manifest it to others as well. So don't think it's only that person. While you pretend to, that you like others, it doesn't, the human mind does not work like that. But the statement says, if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. The less we see in ourselves, the more we shall see to esteem in the infinite purity and loveliness of our Savior. Now, I have a tendency to feel good. When after speaking and arousing people and seeing how they're responding and how they may be, the smile on their face and that the word may be getting true, you know, you have a tendency to feel good. I mean, Jesus said, that should be where your joy is. But the moment you begin to take credit, praise, glory to yourself, it contaminates all the good done. So every time I pray, I say, Lord, Use me to bring honor and glory to your name. May I not take any credit, any glory, any praise. Let me be simply a mouthpiece. The, you are the hand. I am the glove. And the hand and the glove working together can achieve much. So we have to fight to keep back that self that wants to take the glory and the credit for what good may be done. But remember, in the back of my head, I ask the Lord always, help me always to keep in mind that whatever good I do cannot save me. 
My righteousness and my salvation is found only in what Jesus Christ has done for me. Only. All the good deeds are simply manifestation. But help me recognize that constantly. All the preaching, all the teaching cannot save me one ounce, cannot contribute to my salvation, cannot earn my salvation, or has no merit in God's eyes. It is only what Jesus Christ has already done for me. And he has forgiven me. He has accepted me. He has justified me. He has already reconciled me to God. And he has already glorified me, sitting with him in heavenly places. That's what the Bible said. All right. So the less we see in ourselves to esteem, the more we shall see to esteem in the infinite purity and loveliness of our Savior. A view of our sinfulness drives us to him who can pardon. And when the soul, realizing its helplessness, reaches out after Christ, he will reveal himself in power. The more our sense of need drives us to him, to the word of God, and to the word of God, the more exalted views we shall have of his character, and the more fully we shall reflect his image. True repentance, true confession, ultimately leads to our being restored in the eyes of God. And that is a blessing to know. May the Spirit of God speak to every heart and soul here this morning, mine included, because I'm speaking and I'm also listening. I know my nature. I know the excuses I've made for coming late. And all the other, all the others have put that before the Lord and have done what I've had to do. Not only secretly before the Lord, but if it has to be done publicly, do that and make sure that there's a change. If there's no change, it is evidence that we have not truly, genuinely repented, not truly confessed. Hence, no change whatsoever. Not only keep it to yourself, but share it with others. And there are people who come late after the message, share it with them. Share it with them as well. And God's word will spread like that. Let us pray. Gracious God and Father, help us to hear only your voice and let your spirit speak deeply in our souls. Search our hearts as with a lighted candle so that we may truly do like Daniel. Seek you and truly repent and truly confess and truly put away the sin of our doing. May we abhor our sin like filthiness. And may we truly cling to Jesus, whom to know is life eternal. May this message by your spirit be carried to every heart who has heard this morning. And even for those who might not have heard and who may not even listen again, we pray that others may tell them that they too can make a commitment to surrender all to Jesus. Thank you for being with us this morning, for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for all your blessings towards us through this day. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. Have a good Sabbath school discussion.